Now, Dr. Nibley's talk is going to be on the Jerusalem formula for peace. And so it's my privilege and honor to introduce to you Dr. Hugh Nibley. The man was right. The man was right. The introductions always backfire as soon as they've heard me talk. Well, we're going to talk about the Jerusalem Formula for Peace. The main theme is world peace through world law, and it's liable to raise a smile. Notes all over the place. That's Professor Atiyah. Uh Where's France? You haven't got the... Oh, this isn't supposed to make noise, eh? Oh, this is just a lie detector. I'm going to put this out of the way here. However, this, uh, now we've got to watch our grammar and everything with this thing working. Um, it reminds you of uh, Clarence Day's little rhyme. Might and right are always fighting, in our youth it seems exciting. Right is always nearly winning, might can hardly keep from grinning. Or Reston's essay in the paper this morning. He, was, he devoted his time to the terrifying theme this morning that after all has been done, he says there's a dawning realization in Washington today that after the best plans have been made and been successful and succeeded, still the problem of world peace is hopelessly beyond our grasp. It's just too big for us to handle. That, he says, is a thing that's occurring to a lot of people today, not from doing the wrong things in the wrong way, but from doing the right things, the best thing they can do. It's still beyond our grasp. It's not the law you obey, but the person who enforces the law. As Brigham Young says, the law is for the lawless. You know this, and they're only ruled by force. But there's such a good a thing as good force, and uh, there's an attractive force as well as a compulsive force. Solon says that, you know, if, you, if we're obeying the law because we regard it as a holy thing, because we love it, we're still being forced, but we're being attracted rather than compelled in that case. Now the question arises, can there be some great attractive force that would bring about some sort of world peace without the compulsive force. This was the old Jerusalem formula. It's very ancient, very well established, and has been given lots of tries, and it's still being tried today. The, uh, <clears throat> so that's what I'm going to talk about, the, the Jerusalem formula. It's the doctrine that peace will only come when the law goes forth out of Jerusalem, when all men are drawn toward it, when the law is given to the world as a holy thing. And it can't even be secular. It has to be given as a revealed thing. Now, this is a plan that people have reverted to again and again and again. I'm not going to preach about it, but give you a quick rundown historically on this. Well, beginning at a very late period, as you know, the Jews and the early Christians believed in the heavenly Jerusalem, that the earthly Jerusalem was a counterpart of it, that the heavenly Jerusalem would descend, that the earthly Jerusalem would rise and meet at some time in the air, that the two would fuse. Meantime, on this earth, we have an earnest of the new Jerusalem in the actual Jerusalem that's here. And it had enormous appeal to people in those days. They made pilgrimages, you know, from a very early time. The Christians carried on the Jewish custom of pilgrimage. And during the Golden Age, from 212 to 330 A.D., the problem of the status of Jerusalem was very hotly discussed all over the Christian world. Where should Jerusalem stand? Just how literal, just how near was a physical Jerusalem to a heavenly Jerusalem, to a spiritual Jerusalem, which could be used as a capital for the human race? The city of peace. Remember Jerusalem? That was the name. Jerusalem is the city of peace, the city of Salem. And the world hailed it as such. This was the Jewish tradition, the Christian tradition, and it was strongly felt that if there was ever to be peace, it would have to be from a government that would be established in Jerusalem by international agreement. Well, <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> as I say, during the Golden Age, the doctors fought about it, and the pilgrimage increased more and more. Now, in theory, the doctors of the church opposed it very strenuously, but uh, actually, they couldn't resist the appeal of the image themselves. A good example would be the best two examples might be Gregor of Nazianzen, one of the great Greek doctors, one of the four great Greek ones, and uh, Jerome, one of the great Latin ones. Gregory wrote some passionate letters telling Christians to stop coming to Jerusalem. They were coming from everywhere. He says, don't do it. You're ruining our whole Christian thesis. We believe the church is Jerusalem. It's spread everywhere. The peace of God is now everywhere. It's, now, it's no longer centered in a temple or anything like that. Stop this foolish practice of coming from Jerusalem. Moreover, it's a threat to manner and morals and everything else. There are pickpockets. There are all sorts of temptations and immorality. It's a, it's a good thing not to do. But where did he write these stirring appeals? On his way to Jerusalem as a pilgrim. And uh, Jerome, 
wrote the same sort of thing very strongly. It's a spiritual Jerusalem. Don't be tied to a physical place and an idea that there has to be a place where we get together and so forth. That's foolish. Aha. Uh-huh. But uh, where did, where did uh, Jerome write his uh, stirring appeals? From Bethlehem. What was he doing 15 years in Bethlehem? He lived there. He thought he'd be nearer to the Holy Center, nearer to the temple if he lived in Bethlehem. See, they couldn't resist this appeal. It's a very strong one. They succumbed to the image. Now, the great center of pilgrimage was originally the temple, as you know, and the Christians carried it on, but made especially the Mount of Olives their center. There was the footprint, there was the footprint where the Lord departed. There was the place where he would set his feet again to judge the nations, and it was believed that all people would gather to that place. So all people still continued to come there. And they uh, adorned the place most magnificently and fittingly to bear out this image described by, well, we get to beta later on, but in 330, Constantine, as you know, gave peace to the world, was the emperor of peace. He conquered the world, and he celebrated tremendous uh, triumphs in Rome, and he built Constantinople to celebrate his victory, the new Rome. He held the peace of the church at Nicaea to impose the same spiritual peace on the world that he had imposed by force of arms, but above all, to crown all his life work, he built at Jerusalem what he called the New Jerusalem, a vast complex of buildings around a great cosmic dome over the Holy Sepulchre, which he regarded as identical with the Holy of Holies of the Temple of Solomon, continuing this hero-centric image, carrying it on. It was a tremendous show. And uh, the bishop at that time was Macarius, who was a very skillful man for publicity. Jerusalem had lagged. He wanted to make it one of the big world cities. So he publicized this, uh, the holy calling of Jerusalem. And miraculously, they started finding everything that had ever been lost, everything that's mentioned in the Bible, the lost farthing and all the rest, even things that were mentioned in, in Proverbs and parables, all were turning up under the auspices of Bishop Macarius, who, as I say, was a great promoter. And he promoted this Jerusalem image and made himself uh, head of many conferences that met there in this idea of discussing world peace, because for him, Jerusalem was the city of peace. And then another circumstance came along. Europe was invaded by barbarians, as you know. And they overran all of Western Europe, and they overran Greece, they overran Macia Minor, 250. They uh, overran Spain, they overran all of North Africa, but they never got to Palestine. Palestine was an island of security. It was early recognized as such. And so we find in the 4th and 5th century, all the rich Romans were pouring their money into Palestine. Incidentally, this is an extremely well-documented period, the 4th and 5th century here, the one we're on now. And uh, we have their letters and so forth, fabulously rich Roman matrons and landowners who would liquidate their estates in North Africa, for example, and send the funds in gold uh, to Palestine and invest it in real estate there and in buildings. And there was a tremendous boom. By the end of the 4th century, there were 300, more than 300 major religious establishments in the little city of Jerusalem, which is a small walled town, as it was then, <coughs> more than 300, meaning by religious establishments, not just churches, but especially libraries, hospitals, schools. They regarded it as the place where humane arts should always be safe and so forth. And for 100 years, it was, it was the one island of safety in the world. This heightened this image. And so we get these stories of, great, of the great ladies like Flavilla and um, Paula and, oh, there are dozens of them, that uh, send all their wealth to Jerusalem and became great patrons of Jerusalem. They endow the foundations, they move their houses there, they build big villas around the city, which number hundreds. The 6th and 7th century, there's a tremendous building boom goes on. It's, uh, <coughs> incidentally, the archaeologist, the French archaeologist Hubert, says an interesting thing about this. When we investigate these buildings, he says, everything and in the records, everything has to be Splendines, Nitalons, Nitains, Mikans, Radians, Cariscans, brilliant, shining, flashing, radiant, glowing. Everything was brilliantly and gorgeously surfaced and colored. This is when they adopted at this time the uh, gorgeous golden mosaics that characterized the big dome churches all over Europe. They're imitated everywhere. But uh, this was the idea of the heavenly city motif, the idea of earthly peace. They had to put all their wealth into something, so it went into these structures. But it's very interesting, he says, when you examine them closely, the engineering is very sloppy and inferior. The workmanship is atrocious. It is slovenly, bad work, badly done. Artistically, as matters of design and so forth, it's outrageous. But they loaded on the gold and the jewels. They had to invest their stuff visibly, so here it was. It's like a 
a uh, Kyrgyz tribes lady or something from the center of Asia that carries all the money of the family. Well, right down here, the Hopis do. You see these poor families where the woman wears a gorgeous silver and lapis lazuli or uh, turquoise ornament all the time. Well, that represents the family's investment. Well, that's what Jerusalem was. It represented the great the wealth of the world. <laughs> there was a big slump, and Justinian took over the cost of continuing this big building boom, and it practically broke the empire. He couldn't keep it up, and the stuff deteriorates. But then there was a... Uh, there were big fights with the Jews. They began, this is typical, see? The world was at peace. It was the great, wonderful post-war world. It was the neon age. See, everything, it was this sort of thing. It was the glory of a billboard sort of thing. And uh, they had nothing to do, as you well know, the, the bread and circuses. This was the great time of the circus factions. And the emperor of Phocis, the Byzantine emperor of Phocis, favored the Greens. And at Alexandria, in all the cities, these fights were going on between the two factions of the circus, whether you were the blue or the red or the white or the green. And uh, the Jews were on the wrong faction in Alexandria. He used that as a pretext. They had a big riot. He called out the army. He sent his general Bonosus to Jerusalem to suppress them and drive them out of the city completely, expunge their religion. There had been a terrible rivalry all along between the Jews because they were making the pilgrimage here too. And so were the Christians. And just as things were hot in a firecracker in the streets of Jerusalem, who should appear at the gates but the emperor Chosros of Persia, who'd come to seek vengeance uh, against the emperor Phocis, who was a bloodthirsty tyrant, and had put together, uh, put to death one of his trusted ministers, who had to be a good friend of Chosros. Well, Chosros used that as a pretext for taking Jerusalem in 614. Chosros was married to a good Christian woman. They took the cross back to Edessa, to, uh, um, not Edessa, but right next to it. And uh, they took good care of it, but that was an absolute world calamity. When 14 years later, Heraclius, the Christian hero, brought the, cra- uh, the cross back. That was a major triumph, and it's celebrated throughout the whole Christian world today. The Catholic, uh, Orthodox, all the churches celebrate. This is a great event, the bringing of the cross back to Jerusalem. The center of the world order was again in Jerusalem. And then another bishop by the name of Modestus thought he would be the second Macarius and started again the same big boom. But it also attracted other people, and just ten years later the city fell to Omar, who transferred the whole Jerusalem image to Islam. He made it the first thing he did when he entered the city. Um, Omar asked uh, the patriarch, Sophronius, he says, take me to the temple. And Sophronius turned red and green and everything else. Well, I'm sorry, we've turned that into a garbage dump. And it was, they turned it into a garbage dump because it had been the Jewish place. Well, he resolved thereupon to clear it off, immediately began work. He tells us how a number of chronicles, how the... Omar, who was the immediate successor of Muhammad, as you know, this was in 638, how he crawled through a sewer to get up there, and immediately that night they started working, leveling off the place, cleaning it up, and there he built the great mosque of Omar, as it's so-called. That structure is now destroyed, but there's another in its place, which was to be a replica and a reproduction of Solomon's temple. From then on, all Muslims were to pray toward Jerusalem. Later they prayed toward Mecca. But Jerusalem was the world center, The world is divided into two sections. There's Dar al-Harb and Dar al-Islam. You've either submitted to the rule of God or you're yet to be subdued. There are no other categories. And this is the Roman concept of the Agar Pacatus and Agar Hosticus. The world is divided into hostile territory and pacified territory and nothing else. And coexistence is possible, impossible between them because the Terra Hosticus is in a state of rebellion against God. This was the Muslim doctrine too. And Jerusalem was made the new center, but it was kept open to the Christians and they kept coming. There's a very moving description in the Venerable Bede, the great Bede, our, the greatest historian of the Anglo-Saxon. He died on the 7th of May, 735, way back there. He describes a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and the most marvelous thing, he says, is that Mount of Olives. They have a big church up on top of it, but a special building. It's round. It has 12 windows and they have a great circular zodiacal light, which is to represent the heavens. And they light that at night, and he says, from all the country round, you can see up there as if it were the heavenly city floating up in the air. And he says, it gives everybody goose flesh. He says, you realize then that this is really a piece of heaven. And they really thought of it this way. They thought of Jerusalem as actually being a piece of heaven on earth, a tangible piece of it. And this leads to a very interesting result here, as long as we're on beta. As St. Augustine said at an earlier time, it was like sparks spreading from a central fire. The spark would spread, it would start its own fire. So they started taking pieces of Jerusalem, pieces of stone, uh, (coughs) pieces of wood, of course, pieces of the cross especially, to various parts of Europe, and each one would then become the center of pilgrimage in its own right under the name of Jerusalem or 
the sepulchre, or the temple. So all over France and Germany and England, you find temples, temple bar and so forth. You find sepulchres, saint sulpice and so forth everywhere. You find, uh, and you find Jerusalem, New Jerusalem in Spain, New, at, uh, in, uh, in Portugal. You find the New Jerusalem in Rome, where Henry IV died, in Jerusalem. You find the Jerusalem chamber in Westminster, where there were pieces of the original. <coughs> what they were doing were reproducing the, the grand original. But it was a network, and they were all centered around this one. And they had a very elaborate, incidentally, I have the re exact references here if you want me to give them. I'm not going to bother with that. They had a very elaborate <coughs> system worked out by which the holiness of a place was directly proportional to its distance from Jerusalem. So a Jerusalem, a 2,000 miles from Jerusalem, was just half as holy as one 1,000 miles from Jerusalem. And they imposed, you know, Charlemagne. This brings in Charlemagne now imposed the Jerusalem tax. Every town, well, and this was taken up by Alfred the Great in England in 883, uh, and um, in Bohemia, by the emperor, in France, it became quite oppressive in France, every cottage, every village, every manor house had to contribute a Jerusalem tax. In England, the, the Jerusalem, a monk f representing later on the temple or the either the temple or the, te or the hospitallers, would go accompanied by the sheriff from door to door collecting this tax, and you had to contribute. It was then taken in other bags to the nearest church known as the Temple or the Sepulchre. From there it was taken to the temple, which still gives its name to Temple Bar, in London, from which it was shipped to Jerusalem. But this idea of world dependence, these little Jerusalems, these, you find many churches going by the name of Sepulchre because they had an original piece of the Sepulchre there, or Jerusalem, I say, or Temple temple bars and temple and temple churches and so forth. It's a strange obsession. But uh, speaking of Charlemagne, in 800, Harun al-Rashid was having trouble with the Omeyads in Spain, and Charlemagne was fighting them too, so he thought he could get Charlemagne's help very effectively by offering him Jerusalem, and he sent the banner and the keys of Jerusalem to Charlemagne in 800. When he received that banner and those keys, then he felt himself authorized to call himself emperor, world ruler, but not until then. Four months before, he'd received the keys and the banners of the city of Rome in the same way. But it wasn't until he received from the patriarch of Jerusalem, from the Byzantine emperor, from everybody else, it was sent by a delegate, it was brought by the patriarch himself, incidentally, and it was brought by the monks of that, uh, of a big monastery there that had been, that had been having, they'd been having a big fight with the, with the Jacobites about something or other. But they brought him these insignia, and that gave him the right to rule the world. From then on, he becomes the Emperor Constantine. Then he endowed it very heavily. He set up hundreds of, of institutions there, big schools, big hospitals, libraries, all sorts of things, always this cultural fascination in Jerusalem. He wanted to make it a divine thing. Incidentally, this Jerusalem tax just continued the old temple tax to the Jews. Cicero talks about that. In their various oration, he talks about Jews coming clear to Sicily to collect a temple tax for, for Jerusalem. Well, then comes shortly after, things were very bad in Europe, uh, bad years. In Ralph Glauber's chronicle, you see it rained too hard, and then it didn't rain at all. And, and this is basic in politics or anything else. And this end of the world craze set in. Everybody was scared to death about the end of the world. This started big, big uh, mass pilgrimages to Jerusalem. You find the Bishop of Bamberg, for example, leaving 4,000 people, armed and otherwise, to Jerusalem. You find the Duke of Hainault. You find very important people. Nobility would get together, as from Flanders, and lead a huge armed and otherwise pilgrimages. They weren't crusades, pilgrimages to, to uh, Jerusalem. And then these were interrupted by the Turks. Then was when the Seljuk Turks took over. Muslims as such never stopped it. The... Uh, the... Uh, the dynasty of Harun al-Rashid never interrupted it at all. They encouraged it. But when the Turks came in, they were a different breed, and they started taxing them very heavily, as you know. It wasn't, it wasn't the <coughs> pro prohibition entirely, but the taxing that was annoying. So when in 1085, Robert the Frisian took a large armband on a pilgrimage and visited all the holy places, defending themselves as they went and refusing to pay tax, that was hailed as a tremendous sensation in Europe. The Byzantine Emperor, the Pope, all the kings of Europe, and especially the people that had a great popular enthusiasm, regarded this as the avant-garde of a liberating crusade. They showed it could be done. If we went there in arms, we could win the whole thing back. And the crusading idea spread, as you know, and uh, then in 1095 we have the, the uh, St. Bernard and the launching the crusade at Clermont. But... Uh, the sensation of this, of this uh, thing, everybody picked it up. 
It became a subject of popular songs and everything else. Robert Le Frison, he was going to say, was going to save the world. He became a great international hero. So the world started going back to Jerusalem. Now the Crusades restore, which have given, left us an enormous literature, as you know. The Crusades restored this image, this apocalyptic image of Jerusalem. They used the language of the Old Testament, but they always also used the language of the world in arms. They were going back for a showdown with the powers of darkness. They had cast down the gauntlets. This was to be a trial by arms in the feudal manner, a trial by arms in which the judgment of God would be made clear against the infidel. This idea, again, about the world being divided into two camps. In this case, it was the old East and West, and it was to be an Armageddon. After the First Crusade, immediately after, as you know, under Baldwin, they sent up the famous Assizes of Jerusalem. Now, it's been recently shown in a number of studies that the Assizes of Jerusalem were never meant to be seriously applied as the local law in Jerusalem. They were a model of world government and of feudal government. It's the perfect feudal government. It's the perfect model of government. There's no indication even that any effort was made to apply this in actuality the Jerusalem Assizes. But one thing they did do, they did put on tremendous pageants. The pageantry is absolutely unspeakable, as we read of in the histories of Jerusalem. And we have some pretty gaudy histories of Jerusalem, William of Tyre being the most famous. Uh, they tell us this unbelievable pageantry and splendor that drew all the nobility of Europe to Jerusalem and made Jerusalem the center, around which from then on, as Runciman has recently shown, from then on, the nobility of Europe always orbited around the, the Jerusalem concept. In fact, in this recent study, Runciman shows there's not a noble house in Europe today. All these old, broken-down uh, people you've never heard of, families, obscure families, at least one member of the family claims the crown of Jerusalem. Everybody does that today as a matter of course. But this incredible pageantry... Here's an interesting case. I know it's on the back here. In the middle of the 12th century, there was a typical meeting at Verona to discuss Jerusalem as a free city, and they opened it as a free city, and to discuss its fate. Present at the, at the conference were the Patriarch of Jerusalem, the two Grand Masters of the Temple and the Hospital, the Pope, the Emperor, and Saladin's representative. This was right in the middle of the Third Crusade, and Saladin's representative was there. Saladin claiming Jerusalem as, as own as a direct descendant of Sarah, not as of uh, Hagar, as you would expect, since he was a Muslim, but of Sarah. He was Kurdish. And he claimed to be directly to Senate of Sarah, and he claimed that he was the guardian of Jerusalem. And as you know, he took it away. Richard Lionheart didn't get it back again because the morning he should have attacked, he suddenly changed his mind and didn't, and the whole thing flopped. He could have taken it easily if he'd just walked four miles farther. But uh, they lost everything. But the interesting thing is that here at this conference at, at uh, Verona, here's Saladin's representative with letters from Saladin to his most victorious brother, the Pope, speaking as equals and... Uh, arranging the fate of Jerusalem as a world center, a place of peace to agree on, pilgrimage for everyone, an equally holy place for the Muslims, for the Jews, and for the Christians. It was a moment of idealism here. But then the f defeat of the Crusades destroyed the feudal image. It was, a, it was a smashing defeat. It was too bad, but it was a thorough one. They had uh, stated the proposition that it would prove the divinity of the cause, and they lost their shirt. They lost everything. This actually, as Grousset and others have shown now, was the real reason for the collapse of feudalism. It lost credit. It's lost face. People couldn't take it seriously after that. That also foundered on the rock of Jerusalem. And this is followed by the very interesting period of grand designs, the expensive military and bloody and tedious military operations now cease after many crusades. And now we come to the time of grand designs and world strategy, global strategy, all centered in Jerusalem. The plans of Charles VIII, of Alfonso of Castile, of Jao II, of Don Sebastian, of the uh, French kings, all rather quixotic with their odd, uh, idealistic, cabalistic designs and so forth. The best known example would be that of Columbus, all of Columbus's plans had just one objection, to get back to Jerusalem, one object to get back to Jerusalem. Both, uh, well, uh, Morrison, an admiral of the Ocean Sea, and Madariaga to Columbus mentioned that a good deal. He had just one objective. The reason he wanted the gold of India was to free Jerusalem. It's the whole thing. Now, Madariaga and de Castro and many of the Spanish scholars think it was because he was a Jew and he was going to... Because he's always talking about it. He uses these Kabbalistic terms. He always talks about this, the temple as the second house. Well, only a Jew refers to the temple as the second house and so forth. But he's drawn by this mystique of Jerusalem very strongly. And another person who's typical is Guillaume de Postel, the most famous philologist of the time, under Francis I, 
They endowed him, the French government let him go there, to make a study of Semitic the uh, philology. And in those early days, he did a magnificent study. He became the teacher of the immortal Scaliger. Well, he came back and induced, tried to induce the Pope to move the Vatican from Rome to Jerusalem. And there was quite a movement. The earliest Jesuits were very enthusiastic about doing that very thing, moving the Vatican from Rome to Jerusalem. Imagine that. He got the French government onto the project, and then he sort of lost his head, if he hadn't already, because he announced that he was the Shekinah, that he was the Holy Ghost. <laughs> then they locked him up. But, <coughs> but uh, he was a great scholar, nonetheless. But the Reformation renounced pilgrimages, of course. They renounced mummery and this sort of thing. But they couldn't leave it alone either. Very characteristic of the Reformation from the very beginning was the building of local Jerusalems, as among the Anabaptists, as a, uh, among the Mennonites, for example. But even more common were big preparations to go back to Jerusalem. Many, many enterprises were undertaken by the early sects, offshoots and so forth, various Protestant groups. The image fascinated both Luther and Calvin. They didn't like this. They said, leave this alone physically. But people did a good deal of it. You find, uh, well, Jung Stilling's plan was a tremendous one. It was... It was underwritten by the Tsar of Russia. This didn't come later. This didn't come until the 18th century. But it was a big thing, and it moved thousands of people all out of Germany. Tens of thousands of people migrated to Jerusalem on the way. They didn't get there. They stopped in Bessarabia, and they're still there today. But uh, the Jerusalem had an enormous attraction. Others would be Christian Hofmann, who ended up in this country building what he called the New Jerusalem, John Lange, the Swedenborgians. The Swedenborgians ended up building a temple in in uh, Philadelphia, which was an exact copy of the Dome of the Rock Temple, the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. These strange things. And in the time of uh, James I, he put Sir Henry Fuchs into, not Fuchs, but Finch, Sir Henry Finch it was, who was jailed for his sensational work on Jerusalem, which became a, which became um, authoritative for 300 years and had great influence, in which he makes the statement that the Jews must return, quotation, must return to Jerusalem, did you get it, a quote, uh, for complete temporal dominion over the whole world. This was his Sir Henry Finch, and this, this caught on everywhere. As I say, James I jailed him, but the Quakers took it up of all people. Uh, we have a good example of that. Uh, George Robinson was a Quaker. Now, this is a typical example of the equivocal state in which they find themselves. He risked his life time and again to get to Jerusalem. He'd be driven back, then he'd try it again, and oh, he had hairbreadth escapes. He was a heroic character. He finally got to Jerusalem. And then he holed up with the Irish monks there, and they said, well, aren't you going to visit the holy place? He said, oh, no, that's mummery. That's, uh, that's idolatry. I wouldn't dare do that. They said, why did you come for? Well, he scratched his head, and he went out in a, in a plaza, an open place, and he read a tract and then went back to London. But he risked his neck to go to Jerusalem, <laughs> but he didn't believe in Jerusalem. <laughs> this is the funny thing. The same thing with Purchase. You've all heard of Purchase Pilgrims. He wrote these long accounts of the various pilgrimages to the Holy Land. He's writing in the 17th century. He despises it as mummery and superstition, but he was an ardent pilgrim himself. And so with Philip Schaft, Edward Robinson, you could go down the list. They find themselves in this position. Well, the... Uh, <clears throat> Then in 18... Well, we've got to skip now. 1841, typical of this. If you read the correspondence of Budston and Gladstone, this ended up in the setting in 1841 of the Anglo-Lutheran bishopric of Jerusalem. But what was the idea behind this? It fizzled. It went out after a couple of years. But in the letters, Gladstone and Bunsen both make it clear this was their plan. This would be a temporary bishopric set up. They put a Jew name of Alexander, a Polish-Jewish convert, to be bishop of Jerusalem. But he was only to be there temporarily until the Jews would take over, and from there the world would be governed. Believe it or not, Gladstone talking like that, that, uh, the, God, that the Messiah was to return, that the Jews were first to take over Jerusalem, that, uh, and Bunsen and Gladstone worked together, and uh, an enormous lot of diplomatic correspondence and money went into it, and they did set up it, and it did last till the, uh, nearly to the end of the century, but nobody paid much attention to it, and then, then it fizzled out. The... Um, then, it, uh, well, that was one of the main reasons why Newman broke with the Catholic Church. He thought this was a base concession to the Jews, and, oh, he got very worried about that in 1847. Then Rome sent a resident patriarch to Jerusalem for the first time. Then goes this mounting interest in the holy places. Everybody is so patronizing. Everybody wants to control Jerusalem. Everybody wants to get into the act, resulting in the Crimean War, the foolish affair of the holy places, as Louis Napoleon called it. 
The France, see France under Francis I, the capitulations of Francis I in 1553, gave France the protection of the holy places. But France didn't do anything about it. They just had the right. It was renewed in 1773 under Louis XIV, but they still they had the right, but they didn't do anything about it. Meanwhile, the Russians had been very zealous. They'd been protecting pilgrims, building holy places, repairing ruined churches and so forth, and they felt it was their right. And so it was the Tsar versus Louis. Napoleon. He was stuck by a commitment home, and the result was the first of the bloody chain of European wars that overthrew the old order, all fighting about the holy places in Jerusalem. That was the cause of the Crimean War. Well, after that, the great powers set up their all mercenary institutions. A good example would be Eugenie's plan. After, what's his name, was discredited, Louis Philippe, then the Empress Eugenie started, a busy, fanatical sort of woman, started writing letters to all the royalty of Europe, to all the crowned heads everywhere, saying, let's get together and make Jerusalem our big project. Let's make it the symbol of royalty, royal blood, royal breeding, and all the rest. And uh, this became an obsession with her. Well, she didn't find any takers, but ever since then, well, it's all along, royalty, as I said, Brunsman says, has orbited around Jerusalem. The Kaiser is a good example. He said is in the autobiography, his favorite toy as a child was a, a big model of Jerusalem called the Heavenly Jerusalem. It was a model of the Heavenly City. He used to play for it with ours. It belonged to his great aunt Louisa or somebody like that, and she used to let him play with it. And it fixed his mind on this Jerusalem image. He said it had move, movable domes and everything could take it apart. It was the Heavenly Jerusalem. And he, Jerusalem was his passion, as you know. It wasn't Belgium, it was Jerusalem. He uh, uh, gave the Dormitian to his Roman Catholic uh, subjects, in order to appease them. Then he dedicated the huge Protestant church there, to which he invited all the Protestant clergy of Europe. When, in 1898, here's the Kaiser entering, in July, wasn't it? He enters Jerusalem, he enters the Jaffa Gate, clothed in a resplendent white uniform, riding a white charger, and Theodore Herzl, the father of Zionism, comes out and greets him in a speech in which he calls him the Emperor of Peace, making a great entry into the Eternal City. Always this imagery, so we get World War one, but not as a result of that directly. <clears throat> but the thing is that this is the image, and when Allenby took the city, that was regarded as the fulfillment of prophecy throughout the Christian world. Since World War II, Jerusalem has been a world center of ecumenical Christianity. You see the same thing going on. Here's a few cases. The YMCA International Prayer Week met there in 1951, a big thing. The Grand Mufti's Tea to unite all Muslims, Christians, and everybody else in 1955. The World Conference of Pentecostal Organizations in 1960, the Great Baptist Pilgrimage of 1955, the Catholics in the Holy Year of 1950, and so forth. In 1948, the Vatican called, quote, for the growth of Jerusalem as the universal Christian religion, cultural, and educational center. They still have that vision. Today, the Christians have decided to let the Jews carry the torch, but their success is viewed as a baffling paradox. Well, I see the time is up. Toynbee says in the ninth volume of his immortal work, there's only one group that, uh, never, that uh, never caught the vision of Jerusalem, and that was the Mormons. They faced west rather than east. But actually, in 1841, Orson Hyde, one of our apostles who was Jewish, dedicated the land for the return of the Jews from the Mount of Olives, and we've left it to them ever since. That's their show, not ours. And we have nothing to do with it. It's true, we have never been attracted by this Jerusalem image at all. It's, a, it's not our business. But this is a perennial image here, as I say. It's, it's outnumbered all other pre outwitted, outlasted, endured all other peace plans. The doctrine is that the world will only know peace, as I say, when the law goes forth from Jerusalem. That international peace must be a holy thing. And this is the image to which we always revert. Now, it's still just as alive as it was before. But look at all the times it has interrupted human history. Look at the tremendous role. We talk about our Western thinkers and so forth. But as Professor Yeager points out, their influence on Western thought has actually been negligible. They were academic. And uh, we pay more attention to them than we should because we're academic too. We think that the scholastics had great influence. They didn't have great influence at all. But this sort of thing has had tremendous influence. That, that Jerusalem there, we've still got to reckon with it. And there are many people who think and think secretly uh, that, or openly, that if we're ever to have peace in the world, it must come from Jerusalem of all places. Thank you.